Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Sean, uh, joining us online. We want to welcome all of you joining us online as well with Pastor Sean and Pastor Barb. We're praying for you guys. Uh, can't wait for you to be uh, feeling just 100% back with us. Uh, we miss you. Everyone here in the room doesn't really realize how much they miss you, but they're only about 25 minutes. Uh, but we do. Man, I love our lead pastor. Can you guys, can we just give it up for uh, Pastor Sean, uh, Pastor Barb? We love you guys. Thank you. So grateful, so blessed to be under their leadership. Uh, and, and that's uh, saying something. That's my dad, that's my boss, and uh, that's my pastor. There's a lot of things all wrapped up in that, and I'm grateful for each and every one of them. He does them all with grace and, and really, really well. So thank you so much for all that you both do uh, for us, for our church, and pastoring us. If you're new here, uh, welcome. My name is Gabe. I am our student director, one of our student directors now. I've been the student director here for about eight years, was having so much fun uh, that I thought, I just can't keep this all to myself. And so we brought on uh, that bald-headed wonder you just saw. Uh, we call him the bald eagle at youth group. Uh, I do, I'm trying to start it. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, just having a great time. I love student ministry. It's a blast. Uh, I have had the best time, continue to have the best time. Um, I get paid to do like crazy stuff, like have a paint war where we throw somewhere around 800 gallons of paint at each other and then preach the gospel. Like what else am I supposed to do with my life? This is fantastic. Uh, I found the loophole. Um, and so I, I love it. It's been an honor. Uh, if, if you know me, then you know I love getting to do all those things. It's been a while since I've gotten to, to speak with you all on Sunday. Uh, understandably so, we get that. Um, but a lot's happened since the last time I, I, I was with you guys. We had COVID. That was crazy. I mean, still kind of crazy, right? We had a, a pandemic outbreak. Um, we, had, uh, our, we started our miracles campaign at the beginning of the year. Um, that's been incredible to watch that happen, to kick that off, to really believe and start believing God that, man, our future is greater than our past, that our past has been incredible, but man, God, you've got greater things yet still in our future, and to start believing for those things. Uh, just so incredible, so much fun to see those stories start to take effect. Um, this week, you don't know this, uh, the building got struck by lightning. That was crazy, uh, which is why the lights aren't really changing too much, uh, because all week we've been working to just make sure we could turn on the lights because it blew out so much of the building. It was crazy. I mean, you should have seen it earlier. We had like, we had some fun in here. We were just getting stand lights everywhere. We're like, we're gonna light the room however we have to. But we praise God, we got some real lights. Um, lots and lots of fun. Personally, a lot's happened in my life since the last time we got to be together. Last year, our septic system failed. Uh, and that was a great time. I'll tell you what, if you ever wanna, if you're ever like, hey, you know what? I don't really feel like close with my neighbors or vulnerable. If you wanna do something really vulnerable, just fill your septic system and smell the entire street up uh, with, with your septic system. Uh, and, and just every time you walk outside, look at them and, and you just kind of got to give them a wave like, hey, this is my fault, sorry. Like, I wish, I mean, we're young married. There's not much we can do about it. It's gonna be like this for a couple weeks. You know, like uh, just a great time, really vulnerable, really felt like we got close to our neighbors through that process. Uh, praise God for their graciousness. Uh, just a lot of fun, right? Uh, we had our first daughter last year, Nora. Um, uh, this is our daughter, Nora, right here. She's almost, she's about like a little over 18 months, just uh, a little firecracker, just so much fun. I can't keep up with her. Uh, and then we have our second daughter on the way. I think we have one more picture of Nora because um, that's Nora. She loves being outside. We'll get that in a little while, but I, she, that's her trying to go into uh, the drainage puddle outside of our house and, and me furiously trying to stop her. And I'll redirect her and she'll like, like oh, okay. And so I'll kind of walk with her this way and then she'll just turn and bolt. She's like, ah, catch me. And it's a fun game we play where I try to keep her from getting weird worms and things like that that are in, the, in that puddle. Um, so we've, we, we've got a lot happening. There's a lot that's happened. I love having kids though. I love having a daughter. Um, I'm so excited for our second daughter. We're gonna have two daughters under the age of two, which is gonna be a lot of fun for a while. And they're gonna turn like 13. Um, and it's gonna get really interesting and then they're gonna get older and I think we're gonna start having fun again at some point. Uh, kidding, we're gonna have fun the whole way through. I can't wait, I love being a girl dad. It's been a lot of fun to see things through their eyes, to be really honest with you. Uh, that's been probably one of my favorite parts of being a parent is getting to watch my daughter experience things that I probably take for granted, right? Like just, I, I, I don't appreciate the things she appreciates. This week she popped one of her knuckles for the first time which is something I do just all the time. Like I, you know, whatever. It's kind of a pastime. It's a hobby. Um, she popped her knuckle and she's learned a surprise face. Uh, I don't know that she really knows what it means, but she knows when something happens, it's probably not supposed to happen. She goes, 
and we'll just look at you until you make the face back at her. Um, it's like our acknowledgement that something weird has happened here. Uh, she popped her knuckle and immediately looked at her mom like, is, is the world gonna die? Like, is my finger about to fall? Like, I, this has never happened, I don't know what's happening. It didn't hurt, but it also didn't feel not, like it didn't not hurt. Am I supposed to cry? Like, she's working through this. Something that's so fun, she gets new toys. Love this. Uh, we bought her like a nice, like a uh, dollhouse thing. It's got things, you know, it's got little, little things to play with, little people, and it's got little chairs and like little animals that go into it. We're like so excited. She's gonna play with this dollhouse. And she comes out and right next to the dollhouse or near it, there's a cardboard tube that I forgot to throw away. And she runs right past the dollhouse, grabs the tube and is running around the house screaming like, okay, okay, schlacking things all over the house. I'm like, well, that's a great dollhouse. You wanna try this? And she's like, she runs over to it and slaps it with the cardboard tube. Guess we're playing with the cardboard tube. But it's incredible, right? Like, and she loves it. I love watching her do those things. She loves, I, I love getting to watch her go outside, right? Everything's a new thing for her out there. A bird flies in or a plane. She doesn't really understand what planes are, but she knows they make noise and she can, I don't know how she can see them, but she can definitely see them. And like she, it, a plane goes by and she'll sit there until the, from when she sees the plane to when it's gone and she'll just wave and say, hi, hi, hi. And the plane never responds, of course, right? Like, and, and I wish I could tell her, like, it doesn't hate you. Uh, because she just looks at me, she's like, hi, why won't this respond to me? But so interesting, right? She has a great time. I love getting to see the world through her eyes. Pastor Sean has been walking us through this journey uh, this year called the ancient path, right? And it's been incredible. And our stop this week uh, is on having an eternal perspective, and so as I was thinking about this, um, I, I had to, I'm a youth pastor, I have to title my messages something, right? Because I'm trying to get it to stick in, in students' minds. And so my, the title for my message this morning is Puddle Jumpers and Ditch Diggers. Puddle Jumpers and Ditch Diggers. And we're talking about having an eternal perspective. And this really comes out of uh, this verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. It's all throughout the Bible, but our verse for this morning, kind of our, our foundation verse is gonna be right up on the screen. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. It's always good to read the thing in your Bible to see that I'm not making this up. I didn't just like write something that kind of sounded like the Bible, add a couple extra lines in there, right? Like, hey, uh, tithe and then give an extra 2% to Gabe, like it's in the Bible. Uh, if you don't open your Bible and you don't read it for yourself, you don't know what's actually there. So I always encourage our students and I'll encourage you always do that. The church is a great place to bring your Bible. If you've got an app, got the real thing. But if you don't, we've got it on the screens for you as well. Why don't you be able to follow along? So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18 says this, therefore do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is seen, or not, uh, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Here's what he's saying. We've gotta do some work to shift our perspective. Our perspective, it's easy to understand why people would look at what's seen, because how do you focus on what's unseen? It's very difficult. But the problem is what's seen is temporary. It wastes away. It won't last. What is unseen is eternal, and so we've got this choice to make that Paul's writing about, he's saying you can choose to focus on this thing that's gonna waste away, you're gonna lose it, or we can focus, and we should focus, on this thing that's eternal, this thing that will last forever. In life, sometimes we need a change of perspective. Uh, sometimes something changes our perspective, uh, sometimes we choose to change our perspective. For me, one of those things, like I said, is having a daughter. That changed my perspective in ways I never thought it would, I didn't understand it, right? One thing I've noticed with her is that her desires are so simple right? They're super simple. They, they come down to like five things, right? She um, loves TV, the Wiggles specifically, big fan of the Wiggles and Moana. Um, she loves puffs, those little pirates booty cheese puffs, big fan. Uh, soft things. If it's soft, she's going to run, dive into it. She's going to cuddle. You lay a blanket on the floor and she's happy for like the next 20 minutes. Um, Pops, she loves her pops. Uh, in Maslow's hierarchy, if it was Nora's hierarchy, pops is the pyramid tip. He is just top tier. Nothing beats him. And outside, like I said, she loves being outside. If Nora's having a bad day, just take her outside, grab the hose, spray the ground for a second, and she's good for about 30 minutes. And when she starts not being good, grab that hose again and just spray again and rinse and repeat and use as necessary. 
She loves it. She's gonna get in that. She's like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. You, a magician. You just made this fun little thing to play in this puddle. I'm gonna splash, I'm gonna throw on. And she loves it, right? Giggles and squeals and screams. And it's just a great time. But as I've watched her and I've realized how simple her desires are, I've learned that her desires are simple because of a perspective that she's stuck in. Her desires are simple because she has no frame of reference for anything else, right? This is all she knows. And, and, and so what I've learned is that her perspective dictates her reality. And as I've watched her and learned that about her, I've also realized it more and more about myself, that my perspective dictates my reality and that my desires are so simple, far too simple, I, I would argue, right? What I mean isn't that reality changes from person to person, right? That truth is not truth. I, I'm not, there is one truth. There is one reality. This is, this is we follow this, this life, this path, the, the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus. What I'm saying is that the way that I perceive the world, the way my perspective impacts and affects the way that I start to make decisions, Right, as I, my decision-making paradigm is centered around my perspective in life. And so as I have my perspective, my reality starts to take shape. The things that I choose, the things that I give my life to are centered out of this reality. So my, re my perspective dictates my reality. So this morning, I wanna invite you to ask yourself, what is my perspective? What's my perspective? If it dictates my reality, what is my perspective? We got a couple verses we're gonna go through. We don't have a ton of time. So we got two verses we're, we're really gonna center around. The first one is 2 Kings chapter three, verse 15 through 18. And Israel is in this situation. There's a couple of armies going to war and they get stuck in the desert. And they're, they're starting to get surrounded uh, by enemies and there's no water. There's been this huge drought. There's no water anywhere near them. They're facing death from a drought and they're also facing death. If the water sh shortage doesn't kill them, the enemy is coming to them and they're gonna kill them. They have a big issue and the Israelites are pretty upset. They're like, God, you didn't bring us out here to die, did you? And so they call for a prophet and the prophet comes and that's where we're gonna pick this verse up. Second Kings chapter three, verse 15. And here's what the prophet says. Now, but now bring me a musician. And it came about when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him and he said, this is what the Lord says, make this valley full of ditches. For the Lord says this, you will not see wind, nor will you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water so that you will drink, you, your livestock and your animals will all drink. And this is an insignificant thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also give the Moabites, your enemies, into your hand. Verse 16 is where I wanna focus for just a minute is that he said, here's what the Lord says, make this valley full of ditches, full of trenches, right? Make it full of ditches. The Israelites are stuck in the desert with no rain and no water anywhere near them. And they're given somewhat of a strange order for being honest, right? Like go dig some ditches. I'd rather not, right? Like if, if the Israelites are confused and upset in this moment, it's understandable, I don't really want, it's hot. It, it's hot in Florida right now. Yesterday, Emily told me, my wife was like, hey, it feels like 107 degrees outside according to the app. And I was like, what? I know we live in Florida, but that's too much. Come on. It's hot. What I don't want to do when it's hot is I don't really want to go outside and dig holes. Right? The Israelites understandably are like, there's no rain. He, the, Bible, the prophet just said it's not even going to rain. Why are we digging these dumb ditches? I don't want to do this. They're given a strange order, and if, if you're like, well, it's not that strange, it's at least tedious, boring, and easy to lose motivation. It's gonna be easy if we're in the middle of a desert and all we're doing is digging holes while it's blazing heat, and we know there's no, no, no rain coming. It's easy to lose motivation in that moment. I'd understand it. It's understandable. This actually happens a lot in the Bible where the perspective of the person in the story is understand, understandable, and yet ultimately, too simple, it's too small, it misses the picture, right? In this story, he says, dig the valley full of ditches and you're not gonna see this, you're not gonna see rain or wind, nothing's gonna be a sign that water is coming, but I will send water. Doesn't make sense, it's understandable to be upset, but the perspective is too small. In John chapter four, Jesus is talking to a woman, it's a similar moment, uh, where Jesus is talking to this woman at a well, and he has this interesting moment with her where they're having this conversation. Uh, his, his disciples have all left. It's just Jesus and this woman. And he begins to try and shift her focus. 
He begins to try and shift her perspective away from where it is and where it's understandably into where it should be, into his perspective. John chapter four, verse seven. Here, we're gonna pick it up in the middle of the story. And here's what it says. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to the town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews, and Samaritan, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Pause. So he asked for a drink and she begins to answer like, how can you, you know, understandably, again, you have no way to pull water from this. You really shouldn't be talking to me. What's happening? And Jesus takes this opportunity and starts to try and shift her focus, right? If you knew who it was that you're talking to, you would ask for something greater than this, this water. You'd ask for a living water. Right, so let's see, he, he tries to shift her focus. Let's see if she picks up on it. Verse 11, sir, the woman said, or I, I skipped ahead, there it is. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where can I get, where can you get this living water? So she missed the point, right? And it's okay. Let's see if Jesus gets angry with her. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? So now she's getting a little snippy with Jesus, Right, like, you don't have anything to drink with. Are you greater than the great, our father? Right, so she's getting a little short with him. Let's see what Jesus does. Jesus answered in verse 13. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become a spring of life, of water welling up to eternal life. See, Jesus is always focused on changing the perspective. And he's actually not angry with this woman when she doesn't get it. She misses it the first time. He comes again and she still kind of misses it. And he keeps on with this woman until all of a sudden it clicks with her. We're not gonna continue on, but I'd encourage you to go finish the story in your own time. Life change happens in her and it starts to take hold in other people's lives. This is throughout the Bible. This is the story of the Old Testament and the New Testament that consistently the people's perspective is wrong. It's lacking. It's too small. It's too simple. Right, as Jesus talks to a man named Nicodemus and he comes in the night and asks the question, Jesus says, you have to be born again. And the man misses it. How can a man be born of his mother twice? Is he supposed to crawl back into his womb? And Jesus is like, all right, let's shift. I'm gonna try again, we're gonna shift focus. Right, as he comes and his disciples say, there's too many people, we can't feed all these people. They bring him five loaves and two fish and Jesus says, it's, feed them with this. They say, how? I'm gonna shift your focus. We gotta to get to a eternal, a kingdom perspective rather than the perspective of the moment. Jesus does this again and again. The Bible does this again and again. It's difficult because perspective for us changes seemingly so much. For example, if you're 10 years old and I tell you, you have six years to wait until you can get your driver's license, well, that's a very long time. Right, It's more than half of my life. And actually, as a 10-year-old, your cognitive memory is only five to six years. So really, that's your entire life. That's another lifetime until I can drive a car. However, if you're 60 years old and I tell you you only have six years left to live, well, my perspective has changed. That's not very much time. Right? What happened? My perspective has moved. If I were to ask you what you'd be willing to do for $5 versus what you'd be willing to do for a million dollars, the answers probably vary quite a bit. For $5, I'm gonna be honest, I'm not willing to do very much anymore. As a student, I was willing to do a lot. As a youth pastor, I know how much they're willing to do for $5 because we play the game all the time. For a million dollars though, I'd do a lot more. Why? My perspective has changed. What about the perspective of this life versus eternity? James chapter four, verse 14 says, Yet you do not know what your life will be to, like tomorrow, for you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You are here one moment, it's, life is a blip, it's here one moment and gone the next. You know, as going back to the story with the Israelites as they're in the desert, they, they have an interesting decision to make. And for me, as I read the story, one thing is certain, only one thing is certain in that story. It's that water is coming because that's what God said. God said, water is coming. Dig the valley full of, full of ditches because I'm gonna send the water. So the question isn't, is water coming? The question is, what are the Israelites gonna do? Right, what are they going to do? They got a couple different options as I see it. Number one, they could dig the valley full of ditches. 
And when the water comes, they can retain as much as they can get. Second option is, is they could just dig ditches until they get tired. They can dig one or two ditches. They can dig five ditches. And what's gonna happen? God's gonna fill one or two or five. As many ditches as are there, the water is going to fill. But it won't have been what it could have been. There's actually a third option as I thought about it. And that's that the Israelites did nothing. They dug no ditches. Now we live in Florida, we see rains, we see, we see pretty much an afternoon rain every day. You can put your clock to it. Uh, we also see hurricanes, those are fun. And, and one thing we know about water and about great outpourings of water is that it always leaves puddles. It will always leave a puddle. Somewhere, the water doesn't just disappear immediately. You know, I think that God, as he sent the water, if the Israelites had dug no puddles, that there still, or if they had dug no ditches, there still would be puddles all over. And I think, in fact, I know that in the middle of a drought and in the middle of a desert, it would be easy to look at the puddle and be grateful and think how great God's grace is. Look at this puddle, it's, it's hot, and all of a sudden I get, there's water here, and we're rejoicing in the puddle, we're celebrating the puddle, and we lose the perspective that in fact what we were promised was a valley full of water. And that we get used to playing in puddles, like my daughter, with no perspective for the greatness that could have been. My daughter loves playing in these puddles. She loves it, and I love having it happen, but what I have realized is that she doesn't understand that just a few miles away is an ocean that's far greater than this puddle that would blow her mind, but her perspective is locked in this tiny world that she knows and understands. Today, my question for you is, are you settling for a puddle? I know I'm, I'm worried in my own life that one of the greatest tools, I, again, I, one of the things in, in doing student ministry for eight years that I've seen is that most oftentimes, the enemy's greatest tool in students' lives, and, and by default, I think, by, in our lives, is not in getting us to do something evil or wrong. It's just getting us to do something that's good, but not God. See, because if God promised you a valley full of ditches, then a win for the enemy is to get you to have five ditches, because it's not what it was supposed to be. And as he gets you to dig five ditches, well, then maybe what if we just did four? Maybe just one. Hey, gosh, look how great this puddle is. We're jumping and we're splashing. It's incredible. It's refreshing. And in 30 minutes, it's going to be gone when God promised a valley full of ditches that would last you for months. And that you and your livestock and everything around you would drink and be alive. In your life, have you settled for a puddle? C.S. Lewis writes it like this as we get close to closing out our time together. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but rather too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite glory is offered us. And like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. We've been promised a valley full of ditches full of water. Like the Israelites, we have choices to make. We've been invited in it. Here's what I know. To dig a ditch, you've got to remove some things. You've got to remove some dirt. In my life, if I want to see God's glory fall over it, if I want to see him do the miraculous and do the incredible things that he's promised us he will do, it's going to take me removing some things out of my life. And when I say that, I don't actually mean bad things. Because it's easy, like we all know we've got to remove these bad things. The Bible talks about sin, and yeah, of course, we've got to get sin out of my life. Yeah, like there's these awful things, and don't murder, don't cheat, don't steal. Like, yeah, we've got to get those out. No, no, no. But I think when you're digging ditches, you're not removing those things. That's just kind of normal stuff. Digging ditches is removing things that aren't bad, but they're not God. They're these things in my life that just take up space. Right? They, they, they might even be close to God things, but they're not what God's called us to. And so if I wanna see God move in the greatest way, I can do a couple different things. I can dig a ditch. I can dig some small things that are easy and God's gonna fill those things. He's gonna do incredible things. Or I could just get aggressive 
about preparing the valley to see God move, to dig ditch after ditch after ditch after ditch until the water comes because here's what he promised, the water is coming. It's not a question. And it won't look like it's coming. You won't be able to see it coming. There's no wind, there's no rain, there's no clouds. I have no signs it's coming. So I'm gonna have to do it on faith because I can't just see it and go, oh man, I need to get out there. I'm gonna have to do it when it doesn't make sense. As the youth pastor for eight years, I'm asking you, please do what doesn't make sense. Our students desperately need it. I know it doesn't seem like it, but they're watching. It matters. The things that you don't think matter, they matter. They make impact, they make impressions that put together, tell me whether or not you believe what you say you believe. Because if I believe God is sending water and that water is gonna bring life, it's gonna be refreshing, then the only thing I have to do is dig ditches. And if I really believe it's coming, I will really do it. But if I don't believe it's coming, then why dig a ditch? Why remove things in my life if God's not really gonna send that thing? See, my perspective dictates my reality. My perspective of what God is really gonna do changes the reality of what I will do. <clears throat> how much, this is the baseline question today. At the end of the day, this is all it really boils down to is how much do we wanna see God move? How much do you wanna see God move? How big do we expect God to show up? That'll change our reaction. Today I wanna ask you, I wanna ask us to aggressively change our perspective and to dig some ditches. As I've invited God to do this in my life, my vision has started to change and I'm not great at this, I'm not perfect at it. I'm not saying this to be like, man, it's so awesome. I'm telling you, this is pretty new for me and, and, and I've always believed for God to do things, but as I've actively asked him, God, would you help me to rip things out of my life, to dig ditches? Would you help show me, change my perspective from the here in this moment to all I can see, right, with a septic system that's busted, with my bills, with this? Would you move my focus from this moment, this finite moment, into the eternal view, the eternal perspective of what's happening around me? And as I've done that, he started to do some things in my life, things that for me are weird. They're uncomfortable. I'll tell you one of them um, is that as I look around this room, if you look next to you, there might be an empty seat. Whoops, not supposed to play with that, sorry. There might be an empty seat next to you. And, and, and if we're honest, I'm an introvert. I'm a huge introvert. I like the empty seat, empty seat next to me. It's comfortable. I've got space. We can move around. I'm not worried about bumping elbows. As I've invited God to do this, what I've started to do is I, I don't actually, and I mean this literally, I don't actually see empty seats in here anymore. I can see the person that's supposed to be sitting in that seat. I see the actual person, I believe, that will be sitting in that seat. Right over here, I can see a younger man, 28, 29. He's come in and he's got clothes that are too big for him. And he's got a hat that's tilted to the back. And he's covered in tattoos. And he's sitting there over here. I, I can see a young woman with long sleeves, She's looking down. She's just hoping nobody walks up to her and notices that her wrists are cut and that she has no hope. As I look in the center of the room, I can see a 60-year-old woman sitting right back there in front, of the, in front of the sound booth and she's sitting alone. She's holding her purse. It's clutched. And she's just alone. She has nowhere to go. She has no one in her life. But she's here, wanting to connect with something. And I can see it all over the room. I can go on and on because I can see every single seat. And as I've started to do this, and as the Lord started to show me, he asked me, is she worth a ditch? Will you, will you empty something in your life so that I can find that person? And so I just started trying to get aggressive about it. I'm not good. There's so many more things in my life that I know I've got to empty and I don't yet have the strength, but I'm trying. I want to let go of more and more and more because I don't know how it's going to affect it, but here's what I know. He promised the water is coming and that person desperately needs it. They're just waiting and they're out there. 
So what are the things in my life that I can get rid of? It doesn't matter if it makes sense. I'm just gonna empty things because the more and more I empty, the more and more you can fill it. I don't understand how it's gonna work. There's no rain clouds coming, but you promised it's gonna do it. And so I'm gonna do it. So guess what? I'm not gonna watch this kind of movie anymore. I'm not gonna use this kind of language for me in my life. Again, I'm not trying to put this on you. This is just one of my best examples is when I turned uh, 21, I decided I would have one drink with my dad so that he never, it wasn't like a behind his back at some point. Like, oh, Gabe had his first drink. So I went with him, I waited a couple of days. I went with him to have my first drink and I haven't had another drink since. Not because I believe it's a sin issue, not because I'm trying to put that on anybody else, but because I said, in my life, I'll empty it out. I'm not gonna have that be something that fills it up. I've seen it affect people too many ways. I've seen it cost uh, parents and in, in, in students in my student ministry something too great. So if I'm gonna go to battle with them, I'm gonna empty this out. God, you fill it how you want. I don't know how it makes a difference in a student's life. I don't know how it gets this young woman right here, this little girl who's got a flower in her hair and she doesn't know it yet, she's gonna encounter Jesus because her parents got her to a place where it, maybe at VBS, Maybe in our kids with Eastman, she's gonna encounter the love of Jesus and give her life to Christ. I don't know how it works, but it's not my job to know how it works. It's my job to dig some ditches because my eternal perspective changes where I'm at. It's not comfortable in the finite. It's not comfortable for now. I'm gonna miss out on certain things that my friends are all doing. I'm gonna not get invited to things. I'm kind of gonna be an outcast in certain areas. But at the end of the day, eternity is at stake. My finite moment can be done away with. Eternity is at stake for these people. I want to invite us to do that this morning. This morning, would you make a decision to have an eternal perspective? First Timothy 6, 6 through 7 says, but godliness comes, uh, with, with godliness is contentment, is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Colossians 3, one through two. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. Right, we can keep going through this. The Bible's so clear that anyone who loves the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in him. That where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if I put my treasure, my heart, in the things of this world, then my heart is going to rust away where moths will eat it. My eternal perspective will change the destiny of the people around me. This morning, as we pray, I'm inviting you, I'm asking you, I'm asking us as a church, as a body of believers, can we go from being puddle jumpers to ditch diggers? Not to dig one, not to dig three, but to dig and dig and dig until the water comes. Because we wanna catch as much of what God is doing as we can. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning, that's our prayer, that's my prayer, is that you would help us to be aggressive, that you would help us to be active, urgent in emptying our lives and changing our perspective and not looking just at what we have in the moment, not just what we're owed and not just what the world has promised us, but Jesus at the eternal perspective of what's around us. Help us to take a break, to pause for a moment, to look around us and see all that you're doing. As we have an eternal perspective, it even changes our view on things like a pandemic. That what the enemy meant for evil, God, you will use for good somehow, some way, God, so help us to look beyond our moment. God, I'm asking for boldness and for courage to empty our life of all the things that aren't out of you. God, we wanna be about God things. We wanna be a God church. When we go out into our families and our communities, God, would you help us to look, not for what makes sense to empty out, but just for what we can empty out. And say, God, I don't know how this is gonna work, but I'm gonna give it so that you can fill it. Jesus, this morning, we wanna be more. We wanna see you do more. As we come to this table, would you help us to make the shift, to change perspective to view our lives in the light of eternity. We love you, we praise you, Jesus, we thank you. For any person in this room that's never made that decision, that never has had an opportunity to look at things, that there's nothing in my life that would encourage me, that would make me look beyond what I am, but I want it. Jesus, you're that thing. You came, you lived a perfect life as a man, you lived a sinless life, died on the cross, taking our place, bearing our sickness, our shame, our punishment upon yourself that you accepted that wrath and that when you died, 
God, and then rose again, you conquered death and offer us the freedom from it. That any of us, any who would choose to follow you, that would give our hearts to you, God, that would make you Lord of our life, God, you would set us free. That you give us that water of eternal life. For any person in this room that needs to make that decision, God, would you help give us the boldness and the courage that as we come forward to take communion, God, that our lives would be changed forever. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus Christ and we pray. Amen.